Well, hey, can we put our hands together for everyone who's visiting this morning? Come on, come on. How many of you had a great time last Sunday with part one of this series, Ghosted? Yeah, yeah. So we're going to get into it today. If you have your Bibles, you can take them out. As a matter of fact, if you don't have a physical Bible, that's all right. I want you to use the V1 Church app, and you click on Sermons, and then when you click on Sermons in the V1 app, you'll see the Bible, and you can actually follow along there as well. I'm so excited for this one. Now listen, just full transparency. I just got done preaching this message for the 9 a.m., and I tried, I know, somebody said, woo, I try so hard. I'm just going to be very vulnerable. I try so hard to preach an encouraging word, but every once in a while, it comes out hardcore. <laughs> and I think part of what you guys like about me is at least you know I'm not compromising the scriptures to wrap them around my own personal opinion, and I'm not just trying to hop, hype you up with a feel-good, uh, you know, at least you know that I'm trying to, as the best I can, get, see, I've spent the last 25 years of my life devoted to these scriptures and reading them in Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic and, and studying the historical context surrounding them and the authorial intent. And so I want to do my very best to tell you what the Bible actually says, not what I want it to say. Okay? And, but there's going to be times when I do that, that the Bible's going to offend you, not me. I'm just serious because it offends me and I'm going on this journey with you, okay? So I just wanted to say that up front. I tr but ultimately, the Bible is this incredibly encouraging message because it's a message of God has a purpose and a plan for your life and that he provisioned all the power and resources you'll ever need for that plan through the saving work of Jesus Christ on that cross on Calvary's hill. So it is an encouraging message, but it also comes chock full of warnings and um, rebukes and corrections. But I guess for me, I, I was raised fatherless, and so I always thought like, I thought having a dad meant he took you out for ice cream, but that's only part of the story. The other part is that he actually disciplines you too. And if you don't have a dad that disciplines you, you in fact don't have one that loves you. And I know that because I used to be a very hard uh, English teacher when I taught English, and I'll never forget one of my students coming up to me at the end of the year and actually telling me, um, pa he, well, Pastor Mike, he said, Mr. Signorelli, he said, I know you love me more than my dad. And I said, whoa, now this was the hardest kid I ever had to deal with. And I said, what do you mean, Ken? I just said his name for the live stream in case he's watching right now. What do you mean, Ken? He said, because you held a standard to my life and you disciplined me and my dad never disciplined me. And as a 17-year-old, he could acknowledge that there's a connection between discipline and love. And so I tried so hard first service to be encouraging and I think I just brutalized like 100 people and never come back. <laughs> I just literally thought to myself, I'm like, we're thinning them out today. <laughs> Let me try to move through this with uh, some brevity as well because of our time constraints here in the movie theater before they open Nassau Coliseum for us. Somebody believes it. Hey, man, I was at an Islanders game the other day. Go Islanders. Okay. <laughs> I'm a Blackhawks fan, to be honest, but I'll take some tickets to any game. And... Um, and we were in there and I was looking, they have a small configuration that's like under 3,000 that they do for Disney on ice. And, and I was getting this vision. You know, every t single time the Islanders score a goal, they go, yes, 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 yes. Do you ever been a part of that? And I started getting a vision of Easter Sunday at Nassau Coliseum V1 Church and everyone saying, yes, 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 for Jesus. For real. Wasn't that gonna be awesome? All right, you gotta give in the offering though. So <laughs> we want it. You pay for it. No. <laughs> which, is, which is actually the point of my message today. Is, uh, <laughs> the point of my message today is that true loyalty is determined by sacrifice. And your opinion is a high-priced toll on the road to unity. And what earns you your opinion is sacrificing your life for that person. Oh man, see nobody, see how quiet it gets? Anyone else like internet memes and more specifically hater memes? Check out one that I really liked. This one is really, dear, this one, dear haters, I have so much more for you to be mad about. Just be patient. <laughs> Don't you like that? Dear haters. Here's another one I liked. 
Hey, do you have a hater who's doing better than you? Me neither. (laughs) Here's another one. Your biggest hater could be your closest friend. People pretend well. (laughs) No, I'm listen. If you've posted any of these, I don't even have a personal Facebook account, so I don't know. I'm not judging you. But the thing about these hater memes that we love, and I posted one literally a couple days ago for fun. But the thing about these hater memes is it, get, it, it fills us with this sense of self-righteousness and it fills us with this sense of like this us versus them. Like, you know, one of my favorite things to preach is this phrase, you don't know me. Because even when you say it, doesn't it get all you fired up? You know, you don't know me. But sometimes people do know you and um, they're not judging you. They're just saying, yo, you're lazy. <laughs> Like they're not haters. They just have good data because they're close to you and they're not being haters. You're just very inconsistent and they're being honest with you. And you're like, you don't know me. And they're like, no, actually, I think I know you better than I know you because then you know yourself because you think you're Gary V, but um, you uh, haven't posted in three weeks and you have all these excuses and I guess like what I'm saying is sometimes we have haters from doing legitimately successful things. And then sometimes we just have very honest friends (laughs) from uh, kind of being inconsistent. See, I told you I'd try to be nice, but we have haters. And I think what I want to talk about this morning is how we can fight the right fight, how we can fight the right fight. When you post a hater meme, you're just stirring up the haters Um, And oftentimes, like God is calling us to a deeper level of sacrifice and commitment to each other than that. And so the other thing is we're talking about relationships. So many of you are probably like, well, I want to hear how I could be a better girlfriend or a better boyfriend. We got any dating couples here? All right. okay, that's uh, (laughs) Um, maybe you're hoping to to learn about how to be a better husband or wife. We have any married couples here? (laughs) <laughs> and or maybe here's the spectrum. We got separated, uh, divorced, remarried. It's it's all in the spectrum. And I, I think like the temptation for me as a communicator was to come in this morning and to talk to you about uh, just strictly dating relationships. But then I had this aha moment. And you want to know what it is? When people sit down with me to be counseled for their marriage, oftentimes they'll say, but my wife, my wife, my wife. And then I'll have this moment as I get to know them better where I'm like, wait a second, you actually create this environment in every relationship of your life. It's just, they don't have to live with you. (laughs) It's like, uh, look, somebody's getting up and leaving right now. (laughs) This is enough. (laughs) This is enough. But seriously, it's like, it's like the difference between your, your wife or your husband Let's be fair. Uh, the di- you know, the difference is they have to live with you and, you, and your, empl- your employer gets to clock out and go home and they just haven't found a way to replace you yet or you're not totally fireable yet, but they don't like being around you either. And, and so a lot of times we think like, man, my marriage, and we hear my marriage is so messed up. Actually, um, like every relationship in your life is strained. It's just that it's in a lower dosage. So you haven't been able to see how toxic it is. You know, like aspirin can kill you if you take too much of it. But, and so sometimes people will reduce the dosage of you in their life to say, yeah, we have fun for a little bit, but man, I don't want to hang with them too much because they're crazy. And, and I think if I can help you today in this next 20 minutes, it's to show you how to get healthy in all of your relationships, knowing that it will also increase the health in your romantic relationships. Because romance is the outward growth of intimacy, and intimacy is the outgrowth of vulnerability, and vulnerability is the result of humility, and humility is the result of knowing Jesus. So without Jesus, you'll never have true romance. Let me read you what Scripture says about it. John chapter 15, verse 12 through 15. This is my commandment. Everyone say commandment. I got to say that because we live in a sloppy, wet kiss, reckless love of God generation. But I want to just help you consider the fact that the scripture that I'm reading right now is in the New Testament and it's after the finished work of the cross. And it's, it's, it's in that, you know, it's, it's good for that dispensation of grace. It's in that era. So it's a commandment. Okay, 
This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Man, isn't it hard to be a Christ follower? Greater love, the most hateful people laugh the loudest right there. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. Oh, oh please, Jesus. I thought you were my friend no matter what, because that's what we say in the theology of our worship songs. I thought, that, I thought that it was like this never-ending blank check scenario that I could just write after every single one of my wrongs. I mean, isn't that the way that grace works? Like, I, I, you know, here's my favorite one. You know I'm never gonna be perfect, God. <laughs> hey, we're all in some measure of sin, aren't we? Right? And then, then we trip over that big lump under the carpet of our own sin that we've just excused year after year. And God's saying, I'm just calling you to the higher level but I give you a command and I want to be your friend. As a matter of fact, watch this. Does anyone want to be a friend of God? Okay, so it says this. You are my friends if, there, if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants. So to graduate from servant to friend is to do what God commands. And it says this, but I have called you my friends for all that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. True friendship isn't just loyalty when you agree, but it's loyalty through sacrifice. And uh, have you ever heard this phrase? Yo, you're my ride or die. You're my ride or die. Anyone ever heard that? You, it just kind of infiltrated our culture. You're my ride or die. You know what that usually means? You agree with me on everything I say, even though my family doesn't agree with me. You're my ride or die. You know what ride or die means? When we did all that illegal stuff, we did it together. You're my ride or die. <laughs> That's what ride or die, I'm just being straight up with you. Ride or die means like, hey, when we messed up, we messed up together. You're, you're my ride or die. And God's like, it's more like they're your ride and die because <laughs> you had to kill your purpose, kill your destiny, kill the next level for your life to ride with them. Oh, I, I will, Bree. I think that was Brie. It's the voice of an angel over there. <laughs> Sacrificing your pride to have a crucial conversation with someone and fighting for unity and love is the real purpose of reconciliation. And what God is wanting us to do is to fight for relationships, not just against them. I, you know, this is what they say when you pastor. The first five years of your church, you're dealing with all the problems you inherited the next five years after that, you're dealing with all the problems you created. So when, I, when we have family talks like this, it's me making a better future for all of us because I want the kind of church that fights for each other, not against each other. I want the kind of marriages that fight for each other. I don't know why I'm just gonna cry right now. I just, something so sovereign about this message. Fight for each other. Fight for each other, not just fight against each other. And this is so countercultural because all the hater memes and, 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 and every reality TV, you know, the word, you don't see reality TV like nothing goes viral. Reconciliation doesn't go viral. Forgiveness doesn't go viral. It's very rare. It's possible and it has happened. But you know what is so much more salacious is fighting against each other. All the blood that you can show, all the cussing that you can put, or cursing, or whatever you guys say in New York, um, it's, 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 that's the real entertainment value. So that's what gets projected. And it's so countercultural to talk about this. And what Jesus was saying was like, hey, you're really not my friend until you do this command, until you lay your life down for each other. And I guess the reason why I had to say it's a command is because I read hearts the longer I go on this leadership journey and I can hear your heart saying some phrases. Here's what your hearts say. Your hearts say, well, Pastor Mike, I'm too tired to, to lay my life down for other people. I'm already laying them down for my kids. I'm already laying it down for, for my job just to survive like, I'm too exhausted to lay my life down for other people. And that kind of sacrificial love, like it was easier when my husband was better. It was easier when my wife was not like she is now, but to give my life, to lay my life down. I mean, it's just, I, I got my own needs and who's gonna help me meet my needs? 
And I think that that is, that is the beginning of it. Most people aren't unforgiving just because you're not a loving person. Some of the biggest grudge holders I've ever met, ironically, are the most loving people I've ever met. It's just that it takes such an incredible amount of strength and grace to forgive. And sometimes they're so exhausted from serving other people that they can't even release the grudge themselves. And so Jesus is saying, like, if you want to be friends with me, you have to fulfill this command. Greater love requires greater sacrifice. You know, you know, it might, you might also be saying, this is my personality. Like, I'm introverted, so I like to isolate. But the Bible gives no consensus for your personality concerning the commands of Christ. There's, there's nothing that Christ commands that your personality can exempt you from. And I'm a living example of that every single day of my life. And so again, if I'm preaching good to you, it may not be the kind of sermon that makes you jump out of your seat and give me a standing ovation. But if we got to the point where he said, God, I, I'm going to reach this point of spiritual maturity where my personality is no longer exempt excuses, an excuse to, to exempt myself from your command. Because I want a church full of people who actually follow Christ's commands, not just following words that make them feel good. Because then in the end, you'll have a, a feeling that's real good. <laughs> Step one, even for the introverts, get a friend, be a friend, sacrifice for a friend. You know, the Bible actually says faithful are the wounds of a friend. Sometimes when a friend tells you the truth, it hurts you, but there's faithfulness in that wound. Faithful are the wounds of a friend that can tell you. Have you ever had one of those moments where you had a full-on conversation with someone and something was in your teeth and they never told you? That's not a real friend. <laughs> you know, and, and, and so good friends are friends that give you good information that are, that are vulnerable with you and tell you that as well. First John chapter 3, verse 16. By this we know love that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the, for the brothers. Matthew chapter six, verse 14 says this, for if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But it's easier to ask forgiveness to God than it is to ask it for, to man. It's easier. And I think that the challenge here is Will you seek forgiveness for each, with each other and then be sowing into your own future? For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Will also forgive you. You know, if you were to ask me a long time ago what it takes to be good at marriage, I wouldn't be able to answer the question at all. I think my newest answer to that question is get good at forgiving all the time. So if you're a young person and you're like, hey man, or you're a single person and you're thinking about getting, getting married, but you're not good at forgiveness, you're not good at marriage. Actually, the Bible says he who finds a wife finds a good thing. So how do you find, if you find a wife, if she's already a wife, that's adultery, right? So it obviously doesn't interpret to mean that. What it actually is, says, he who finds a wife finds a good thing. It means that a woman can be a wife before she's married. And, you, and so if you were to ask me, how do I become a wife before I'm married? Start practicing forgiving people all the time because that's what it's going to take to be in a healthy marriage. If you were to ask me, what's it going to take for me to be in a healthy relationship with a friend, with, with anyone? It's forgive all the time. Forgive all the time. Man, one of the hardest things for me to say was I'm sorry because I have so many reasons why I'm right. <laughs> Seriously. I mean, I, I, it would... I would be in counseling with my wife and I would get checkmated because this, when you go to counseling, eventually you get to this point where it, they break down the wall of cognitive dissonance and you can actually see you are wrong. And so I remember being in counseling sessions where I was like, in my heart, I was like, wow, I, I'm totally wrong. And they checkmated me like I could finally, finally see that I was wrong. And then all of a sudden I still couldn't say I was sorry, even though I knew I was wrong. And I would remember trying to get the words, I'm sorry, out of my mouth were so hard that beads of sweat would start coming down. I know that sounds crazy, but I would be sitting in counseling like, it's time to say you're sorry to your wife, and I couldn't do it. But then I wondered how many generations of Signorelli men before me couldn't say it either. 
And sometimes I think we inherit, like even on a biological, molecular level, this inability to say we're sorry because we come from prideful lineages of people who never said they were sorry. And I, I'm just, my hope and my prayer is that the better I get at saying sorry, the easier it is for Bella and the e easier it is for Everly and because I'm releasing something. And, and so if you're here, like I think it's part of it is get better at forgiving, but then the other part is get better at saying you're sorry. You know, like when you become a member of V1 Church, I actually have this thing that I say to everyone. It's not when Julie and I fail you, or it's not if, it's when, but we just won't do it on purpose because we're humans. And, and I think that we can sometimes miss that. I know this is like kind of a convicting thing, but I want to read to you in Galatians chapter five. This is where it gets really quiet. Can I go there? I don't know if it's quiet because you're sleeping or you're drawn in, but I'm going to assume. Galatians chapter five. Now the works of the flesh are evident. What's your flesh? You're looking at it. You're looking at it. Your flesh is your physical body. So part one of this series is you have the desire of dirt and you have the desire of divinity. You have the desire of God in you and through your life that's willing you to do great things. But then you have the desire of dirt, which is your fleshly body, which is your skin. It's the desires that you feel. And, and inherently, they're not bad, to be honest with you. It's just that they get distorted to become bad. Like sex is a really good thing. God designed it. Thank you, God. Praise you, Lord. You're worthy. Um, <laughs> hallelujah. <laughs> um, but... But sex in the wrong context will destroy you. Sex in the wrong context is called molestation, rape, incest. It'll destroy you. A good thing out of context becomes a deadly thing. And so you have these desires. Do you know even anger is inherently not a bad desire? Because anger can actually cause you to be a champion for the underprivileged and the marginalized in society. And you can actually go on a mission to serve people the rest of your life and, and do whatever you can to stop human trafficking and sex slavery. I mean, anger can turn into righteous indignation and could be a holy anger. Even God's anger in scripture was a holy anger, was a good thing. And But see, what happens is in our life, the only kind of anger we ever experience is the destructive, deadly anger. Now, when I see something happening, when I, when I see the, when I started coming to New York and playing music in the different bars and venues as a precursor to launching this church, I, I would be angry with a righteous indignation because I'd say, these people don't know Jesus and there's 10 million of them and I want to lead them all to Jesus and I'm going to sell my house and everything to get here to do that. So even anger can be a neutral thing, but the desires of the flesh that are outlined in Galatians, there's a very clear warning that we're given. And, and this warning is important. It says this, now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity. Sorcery is a big one. The Long Island medium is a big thing out. Sorcery, this divination, this idea of because of the fears and anxieties of life, I hope someone has a spiritual portal or a gateway to see something. But see, that's a perversion of gift because you'll have the Long Island medium, but you also have the prophetic gifting from the Holy Spirit. And the Bible actually says the Holy Spirit will reveal to you the future. And so a counterfeit for relationship with God is relationship with a medium. So it's a, it's a desire of the flesh. It's something that you feel this desire. I, I have a desire to know the future, but in scripture, when we taught through this, the, the series on the Holy Spirit, it's very clear. It says the Holy Spirit will actually reveal to you the future. He will, he will teach you all things. So the desire to know the future is not evil, but where you go to hear about the future will determine whether it's life or death. So you see that these flesh, the, 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 fl the desires of flesh, the, these things, I, I think probably my less condemning way of preaching it is where are you going to get these things fulfilled? Or, or whether or not they should be. And so it says strife, strife. You know what strife is? Strife is constant fighting. I was raised in homes full of strife. Every day I came home from school expecting strife. I used to actually go to the public library and read all evening so I didn't have to go home because there was so much strife in my home. Maybe in your home there's constant strife. It's a work of the flesh, jealousy, jealousy. Maybe you're full of jealousy. Maybe you can't celebrate someone else's life because you feel so small about your own existence and your own and, and the lack of accomplishments. You know, we live in a world where by 21 years old, these kids feel like failures because they haven't gone viral on social media yet. And so our hearts fill with jealousy. Jealousy is a counterfeit for 
feeling accomplished. Fits of anger, rivalries, rivalries. We have rivalries in our own families. We have rivalries in churches. Man, rivalries like, yeah, we don't like that church and what they stand for and what they, rivalries is a work of the flesh. Here's another way of reading Galatians, this, this chapter. Another way of understanding it is sort of this invitation into a list of things that if you're doing these things, you're the problem in the relationship. Can I keep going? Dissensions, divisions, divisions. Let me give you an idea of how divisions are created. Hey man, Pastor Evan's awesome, but as soon as you said that coordinating conjunction, but divisions, it's a work of the flesh. Hey man, V1 Church is cool, but it's just a division. Like maybe your opinion is right. Actually, we invite your opinion, join the dream team. I mean, there's a way for your opinion to be mobilized into material that makes this house better. We actually invite it, but out of context, it's a wrong thing. And so what happens is there's this thing, and I'm coming back to the first scripture that I preached this morning to you was this command I give you, lay your life down for your friends. And so to me, what it looks like is to earn your opinion is to earn it through a sacrificial life to say, hey, I can say whatever I want about V1 Church because I'm the first one in that parking lot for loading and the last one to leave. I could say whatever I want because I've actually given everything here and I've earned the right to love this house with that kind of opinion. You know, same thing with, with marriage. It's like, it's crazy how in New York, you'll see billboards that say divorce for $399, but we've never spent $399 on dates in a year. It breaks my heart. It's like we'll invest more money in a divorce proceeding than we ever invested in dates. And we have all kinds of opinions about why they're wrong, but what would it look like to fight for them? What does it look like to fight for them? I'm gonna tell you what it looks like. It says, I warn you, I warn you as I warned you before. This is new covenant teaching. I warned you. It's like, this is not the book of Leviticus, y'all. This is not, this is the new covenant saying, I, I warned you, I'm gonna warn you again. And so I believe that if I'm to actually preach this with the level of gravity it needs to be preached, I'm here to warn you as well. I'm, I'm passing the warning that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. See, my prayer for New York is your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Thy will be done. You ever heard that? That's our prayer, but I can't, the kingdom cannot be manifested in our midst if we're acting like that list. We, it says, I'm, I'm warning you, you will not inherit the kingdom if you divide and have rivalries and, and sexual immorality and sorcery and enmity and jealousy and fits of anger and dissensions. It, it, can't, it can't manifest in your midst. And you know that you've been in a place with, with the kingdom of God because the peace of God is there. You know, as I was preparing for this message, there were all these little moments in the Signorelli home this week. My wife, she came on the couch and she sat on my lap. I'm not being weird, I'm just saying. Thank God for marriage. And then all of a sudden, Everly came up next to me and she snuggled me and Bella came there. And all of a sudden, the word that I heard in my spirit was shalom. The peace of God that surpasses all understanding. Me and Julie stopped fighting each other and we started fighting for each other. We changed it. I stopped fighting because see, I'm telling you, you've got to get this because when you learn this lesson, the kingdom of God is released into your midst and it releases the peace of God, which the Bible calls shalom. And shalom, we always think about it as an atmospheric feeling, but it's actually a systemic solution. Shalom is when it infiltrates your school systems and your governmental systems and it infiltrates your business. Shalom is an infrastructure. The shalom of God is literally governmental infrastructure that's installed to say, if you live this way, this life this way, you will have peace. Shalom. That's what the Bible is. If someone's asked me, what is the Bible? The Bible is an instruction to install the government of heaven into your life. And it brings the peace of God. That's what the Bible is. It's a constitution. It's literally a constitution of a government that if you install it into your life, the shalom of God will be released in your midst. I don't have time to, to go into all that, but let me tell you this. I warn you as I warned you before. Now, here's the good news. 
but the fruit of the Spirit, if you will live God's way, if you will accept his command to forgive and lay down your life and be sacrificial, even when it hurts. I mean, the definition of sacrifice is it costs you something. What is it gonna cost you to lay your life down? Everything. I was telling someone last week, whenever there's a battle, someone always has to be the redeemer. See, the redeemer is the person that, that calls the truce. The first person to say, okay, enough is enough. I'm tired of battling it out with you. I'm sorry and I'll do whatever it takes to lay down my life for this thing. Somebody has to be the redeemer. And Jesus was the one who said, I'm not gonna wait for humanity to get it right. While you're still in sin, while you're still messing up, I'm gonna take the greatest gamble. I'm not gonna die for you because I know you're gonna accept me. I'm gonna die for you with no guarantee that you're gonna accept me because I'm gonna put my love on the line and he puts his love out on the line it, it, that's the message translation says and Jesus put his love out on the line while we are yet sinners he gambled he said I, maybe they won't all accept me but some of them will and I'm gonna lay my life down for those who will but I'm also gonna lay it down for those that maybe won't and he says until you can get that revelation you can't be my friend because my friends understand this you know you start the greatest influence in your life is who you act like, and you'll pick up their mannerisms. If you hang out with Julie enough, you'll start saying, yes, no, no, yes. Because Julie goes, yeah, you wanna go out to Chili's? No, yeah, yeah, no. Okay, which one is it? She doesn't know. <laughs> That's what it means. But the mannerisms of heaven, the behaviors of heaven are outlined here. I'm gonna read them to you. The more you spend in the atmosphere of the kingdom and the culture of heaven, you see this. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. What happened to kindness? What happened to kindness? Where's kindness in our society? Where's kindness on Long Island? We're, we're not kind to each other anymore. What would it look like if you left this place with the revelation of kindness and they said, the kindest people we know are those V1 church people. Kindness is a virtue of heaven. Goodness, faithfulness, faithfulness 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 when did it get so easy to leave a church when did it get so easy to leave a marriage when did it get so easy to leave a friendship whatever happened to faithfulness the spirit of God demands faithfulness that says hey I know you're figuring it out I know you're wrong and kind of messed up but I've made a commitment to you on when you're right and when you're wrong, I'm gonna stay faithful to you. I mean, what could we build in this house if we had the culture of heaven manifesting faithfulness that just said, I'm here, I'm not going anywhere. You know, faithfulness will actually, I, I've seen this as a pastor. I've literally made a commitment to certain people's life because they're so wounded that they will even, they will even test your commitment to them by hurting you. They will push you away. There's people, some of you guys are still in these baby things. I'm just calling you out. You're babies spiritually and emotionally. And you're like, I'm gonna not go to church for a couple weeks and see if anyone noticed. And it's just this mechanism because you're so used to getting rejected and hurt in life, you're testing us. But I wanna pass my test. And I wanna have the kind of church that says, I'm faithful to you. You, you don't have to worry about game playing. I'm not going anywhere. And you create that safety. And we got all these stupid pastors that are messing it up with with infidelity and messing with the money and church people are wounded and hurt and, and everyone's coming in triggered all the time. But I'm here to say that the kingdom come, kingdom come into this place. I want to see faithfulness. I, I, I want to see love and gentleness and kindness in the midst of us. And people say, because here's the thing, let's bring it down. And I'm going to close it on this. See, in Israel, and I've said this before, I wanna say it again. I was in Israel recently. I saw a large flock on the side of a hill and I was asking our guide, how is it possible for one person to, to manage all those sheep? And he said, they will always return to the well. He didn't even know he was preaching. On that, on, in this terrain, those sheep will always go back to the water source and they will always gather to the well. My prophetic vision for V1 Church 
is that this in Queens and Syosset here on Long Island is a well for thirsty people. That they can come here and say, there's a kindness and a gentleness and a peace and a meekness and there's a love that, and a joy in their midst that I cannot get that. In. I've gotta go to the well to get that. My, my prayer for your marriage is that your home becomes a well where the broken and the lost can come into your home and feel the shalom of God. And they can say, wow, there's something. You know how many times I've brought people into my apartment and it's healed their heart just for me to be a dad and a husband because there's a well that never goes dry of the spirit in my home. It's the shalom, the very peace of God. And all of a sudden, God will cause you to, to, to break into that thing. Some of us have come into these, these, these marriages. We've never seen love. We've never seen hope. We've, no, we've gone into churches that got so good at prophesying. I'm so sick and tired of it, Herman. I'm sick and tired. Oh, you're deep. You're only as deep as your obedience to scripture. Deep isn't how well you can articulate it. Deep isn't speaking in tongues. Deep isn't prophesying. You know what deep is? Kindness, gentleness, peace, enduring all things, being faithful to people. You want to be deep? Let's be deep together. Let's go the distance together. You want to be deep? Let's reconcile. You want to be deep? Let's forgive each other. You want to be deep? Let's be deep. Let's do the command and be friends of God. Because let me tell you what happens when you're a friend of God. Moses was a friend of God. He wasn't articulate, but when he stood in front of the Red Sea, it parted for him because he was a friend with God. Let me tell you what it looks like to be a friend with God. Joseph was in prison, but he all of a sudden got before the king and at a time of great famine, there was provision for his life because he was a friend of God. And the same people who were Joseph haters end up bowing before him. And you know what Joseph said? get up and give me a hug because I'm a friend of God and I don't hold grudges because my dad doesn't hold grudges and I've learned how to act like him. See, some of us, if our family bowed down before us, we'd say, yeah, execute him. Joseph said, stand up, be restored in a relationship because we're all children before the king. Many of us want a president, I want a king. It's not my opinion. It's surrender. I want to read this last thing. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh. This is how you know you belong to him. You crucify the flesh. You don't say, I can't control myself because then you're saying the cross isn't enough. You actually say the cross has empowered me to manifest the fruit of the spirit, which is self-control. And all these other ones we read. And then you say, it says, they have crucified the flesh with its, which, with its passions and desires, and we live by the Spirit. Let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Why? Because the Spirit's alive. The Spirit's moving. The Spirit's doing something different than He did in your last church or in 1997 or way back when you thought you were on fire for God. The Spirit's moving. My question is, are we keeping in step with Him? Are we moving with them? I want to be the kind of people. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. I want to give you three things just to close this message out. So just bear with me for two more minutes. Number one, everyone's not against you. Everyone is not against you. I've noticed more and more in my journey as a leader that most people have this disposition in life where they have convinced themselves that people are against them all the time. I just want to clear the air because what's funny is I've literally had conversations with some of you in the church where one person says so-and-so is against me while well, not knowing I had a meeting with the other person saying, I don't understand why they don't know how much I love them and I keep trying to show them I love them. And I see both sides like Chanel. Okay, nobody listens to pop music, okay. I have a really sanctified church. <laughs> that was a good sanctification check, Bree. <laughs> Everyone's not against you. Everyone's not against you. But I will warn you, if you think they are, you will create that reality. Because I did that in my own life. If you treat people like they're against you, eventually you will fatigue them from trying to prove that they're not against you and then create a prophecy. And, and sometimes we you see some of you are, are called to be prophets, but you just prophesy real bad over your life all the time. Skip the meme, skip the meme. Let's go to part uh, number two. Peace is less effort than arguing. 
You know, life is hard, but is it hard because we made it hard or because it's hard? We make life hard. You know, peace is less effort than arguing. You know what's less, you know, I, I'll tell you what, I'll never go back. I love the fact that my wife can, can open my phone and go through it and I don't have a panic attack. I love that. I love that. You know why? Because peace is actually less effort than arguing. You wanna give yourself energy back? Stop sinning. You'll feel all kinds of energy come back in your life. I had some people confessing this, like it's time. That this, is, this is freedom time. I, I know it's a hard word. Here's my last one. Number three, you have to fight with the right weapons. So let me give you the wrong ones. <laughs> Here's the enemies to unity. Number one, opinions. Opinion is an enemy to uni unity. Number two, gossip. And I, I said this first service, I wanna say it again. The Bible says, this is scripture, that where there is gossip, there is every other evil work. So I'm not saying you do this, so please don't hear me wrong. Hear me with your adult ears right now. It would be better if you're gonna pick sins to do a seance in your living room than it would be to gossip in your living room. Because according to scripture, it says where there is gossip, there is every other evil work. So the portal to hell is hinging on the door of gossip. It's literally safer, and I say safe in air quotes, don't do seances, but you, we, have, we have elevated seances to like, that's demonic, but if you actually read the Bible, the Bible says the height of all demonic activity occurs when there's gossip. And even when I say things like this, 99.9% .9 of you don't think that you gossip. It's always the most ironic thing about even saying gossip is an enemy to unity because no one ever thinks it's them. So I'm just here to tell you, you're doing it. <laughs> And, and you have a desire to do it, but can I tell you the right way to do it? Gossip about the greatness in people. Gossip about the goodness that you see in people. You wanna talk about people when they're not, they're not in a room? Hey, that's a desire. I'm not trying to take that from you. Change the way you do it and you can redeem it. Hey, because I would love for some of you to hear the conversations I have about you. I, I have every conversation like it's recorded in hopes that one day it gets released and you hear how much I love you. Because no greater love has this than he lay his life down for his friends. And when you got it, get into the fruits of the spirit, you're elevating yourself when God says, no, no, no. Don't elevate yourself to make them look bad. Actually lift that other person up. See how I, this will make all your relationships good. Can I give you a few more? Do I have two more minutes? Okay, isolation is, a, is an enemy of unity. Don't isolate. It's easy to isolate, especially when you can entertain yourself. Don't do that. Fight that. The blessing is in unity. Number four, lack of vulnerability. I'm gonna tell you guys something vulnerable right now. In the last year, the pastors that I've had to counsel and walk through infidelities or mismanaging money have done it in accountability cultures. And so you can say you're accountable all day long, but you're not accountable until you're vulnerable. Because you project so much about, oh, I'm this guy and hey, they can't know that I'm struggling, listen. It's time to get vulnerable because where there's true vulnerability, there's true accountability. You can say accountability all day long while you're doing it. I'm not gonna say who, but I was at a major conference a year ago and this guy lit it up, keynote speaker, one of the best communicators I heard. I went in to check in on him on the other day, lost his whole church and his whole ministry to infidelity while he was preaching accountability. It's a lot easier to say it than it is to be vulnerable. And so what I'm asking, and I wanna read this scripture, do not be deceived, God is not mocked, for whatever one sows, you will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will reap from the flesh corruption, but the one who sows in the spirit will reap from the spirit of life. Would you stand to your feet with me? All right, so here's how we're gonna close it out. The Bible says, confess your sins one to another that you will be healed. Now, when I ask the question, confess your sins one to another so that you'll be healed, who gets the healing, the one confessing or the one hearing it? The answer is both. Because when you're vulnerable enough to confess, that other person hears and says, wait a second, they're not perfect either. Let's go on a journey of healing together. You know, 
I did this last service, I'm gonna do it again. I met people at the altar sec or first service, I wanna do it again this service. And people came up and confessed things to me and masks were taken off and vulnerability was released. And I believe that that leads to true accountability. And I think that there's some people who desperately wanna be free. I want you to do this. Grab your phone, take your phone out real quick. We're gonna do, oh, God showed me this moment. And this is how we're gonna end it. And I believe that he wants to reveal just two more things to you before we get out. So you got a phone. Most phones have a camera. So go ahead and open up your camera. So just take it, open it up. Just do this with me. Now, a lot of them have front facing cameras. So go ahead and flip it to the front and just hold. Now, if you're, if you're older, I want to give you a tip. Don't hold it here. <laughs> this is better. <laughs> All right, I'm helping you. So try it. We're going to do this together. I'm serious. We're really doing this right now. So take your phone. Now I want you to take a picture. All right, now here's what I want to tell you that I believe God wants you to see. You just took a picture of the only person that God gave you permission in this life to change. That'll free you. He just, I, you just took a picture of the only person in life that you can change. That's it. And, and as long as you're trying to change other people, see, if you flip to the wrong camera in your life, you're going to hurt. If, but, but if you keep that camera on the, on you and you say, I'm going to make this about me now, I'm going to lay my life down. I'm going to do what I can. I can't force them to change, but I'm going to change. Then everything in your life will change. That's part one. The second thing I came to tell you today is this, that picture that you took, if you'll go on that journey of aligning yourself with the command to lay your life down for others, that picture will be unrecognizable a year from now. And you'll look at that picture and you'll say, wow, look what what the Lord did when I stopped trying to change my wife, when I stopped trying to change my husband, when I stopped trying to change my boss and my family member, but I said, no greater love has this that he lay his life down for his friends. I became more like Jesus when I kept the camera on me. Is there anyone who's making that commitment with me today? Is there anyone who got anything out of this today? Is there anyone still shook up today? Do you still love your pastor? Yeah.